All right, hello everybody. Um, if you're watching this video, I'm going to assume that you are a student from Physics 216 or Mechanics 1. And so we do find ourselves in a unique situation where we're trying to transition from traditional face-to-face um, -face lectures to an online presentation of material. And so my plan is to try to continue just to cover all the material that we would have covered in regular lectures, but to do it by uh, these YouTube videos. Um, so I'll try as much as possible to just stick to talking about the physics of the course in these videos and any announcements about any changes to our situation or how the course is running or being evaluated those will all be done via the course website and so let me just remind you of the URL to the course website so it's people dot oak dot ca slash j babowsk slash fizz two sixteen dot html okay um and so with that i'll try to present material as best I can through these videos and to deliver the content in a timely manner as 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 timely as I can and I just hope that you'll be patient with me as we try to work out a solution and a system that works best for us. Okay so what we were talking about in the last class was Kepler's laws and one of Kepler's laws was that the planets go in orbits around the Sun and, and those orbits follow an elliptical path. And we had begun by trying to define the shape of an ellipse. And so what I want to do is I just want to, I want to repeat what we had done about talking about the geometry of ellipses first. Okay. And so what you could do to draw a more or less perfect ellipse is you could take two nails and nail them into a board. And so there's, I'm looking down at this board and those two points represent the nails. And so they're, they're vertical out of the screen. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a string and we'll tie it into a loop and we place that string over top of our two nails. Uh, and then with a pen, we're going to put the pen inside the loop and then pull the string taunt so that it's uh, tied up against the nails. And then we'll just trace out the path that we get. So when our pen is in place, what happens is the string becomes taunt. And here's our pen. And then we're going to sweep it around. And what what we should do is we should end up tracing out the path of an ellipse. And so it would look something like that. Okay, um, the distance from one of the nails to a point on the ellipse is called R, and the distance from the other nail to the same point is R prime. These two points are called the foci, and so here's F prime and F. All right, and what we could do then is, let me draw this again, and so without the string, and so I'll try to draw a nice ellipse. That's not too bad. I'll indicate the foci, F prime, and F. And we can go out to some point over here, and I'm going to define an angle theta between the horizontal and the radius r. And then if we go from 
the other foci to this point, that's r prime. Um, so another another quantity that's used to characterize the shape of an ellipse is called the semi-major axis, and the semi-major axis is defined by taking your ellipse and putting a vertical through it that passes midway between the foci. And then if you go to the far edge, then A is the semi-major axis. If we were to, I'm not going to draw it, but if we were to divide the ellipse horizontally, so we draw a horizontal line that passes through F prime and F, and then we measured the maximum distance between that line and a point on the ellipse, that would be the semi-minor axis, usually labeled B. Okay, and then what we have is the distance between the center and say f prime, and that distance is epsilon a, so epsilon times a, and we also have the distance epsilon times a between the center and the other focus f. So epsilon is called the eccentricity. If epsilon was equal to zero, then the two foci, f prime and f, would coincide, and what we would get is a circle. So when epsilon is equal to zero, f and f prime coincide, and the ellipse becomes a circle. Okay. So before going too much further, I want to see what happens if we consider the special point theta equals zero. So let's consider the theta equals zero case. So when theta is equal to zero, um, r points from f and it goes directly to the right, and r prime also is horizontal and goes directly to the right. And so if we draw that case, so there's our ellipse, here's f prime, here's f, and here's r, and here I'll draw r prime in red. Here's r prime. And <clears throat> if this is the center, then this is epsilon a, and this is also epsilon a. So from this drawing, we could, uh, let me add one more thing then we know that this distance here is the semi-major axis A. So from this drawing, if we look at, say, the radius R, and we add to that epsilon A, then what we can see is that combination, that sum, has to be equal to the semi-major axis. So we see that um, r plus epsilon a must be equal to a. If we look at r prime, it's uh, longer than a by an amount of epsilon a. So if we took r prime minus epsilon a, that must be equal to the semi-major axis as well. And so if we add these two expressions together, so let's suppose we add them up, then we would get 
r plus r prime, the epsilon a and the minus epsilon a would cancel. And on the right hand side, we would just have a plus a, which is 2a. So this is one of the characteristic um, properties of an ellipse is that these two radius distances r and r prime um, sum to a constant and that constant is equal to 2a and it doesn't matter what the value of theta is we considered a special case but um, if you think about how we drew the ellipse using our string uh, if we had a string that had a total length l then the distance between the two foci, f prime and f, is always fixed at some value, which we called epsilon a. And so if I was to draw my sh complete string in here again, here's r prime and here's r. And this distance is 2 epsilon a. Then the total length of our string string length is L is equal to R plus R prime plus 2 epsilon A or um, R plus R prime is equal to L minus 2 epsilon A which is equal to a constant and it turns out as we've just proven above that that constant is equal to 2 times A. Okay, good. So the key result that I want to take away from this is that for any value of theta, r plus r prime has to be equal to 2a. This is for all theta. All right. So let's go back now <coughs> to a case of theta is not equal to zero and see what other properties we could work out. So I'm going to draw the ellipse again. And so here's f prime and here's f and we just go to some arbitrary value of theta. There's theta and here's r and here's r prime and in here, we've got the length 2 epsilon a. And yeah, OK, good. So we can actually construct a right angle triangle here by noticing that if we look at this distance, that's just the side adjacent to the angle theta. And so this must be r cos theta. And then if we look over here, we have a side that's opposite of the angle. And so that height above horizontal is r sine theta. So I'd like to focus in on the right angle triangle that we can indicate by this green line. And so let me redraw that. We've got this right angle triangle where this is r prime, this is r sine theta, and the horizontal length is 2 epsilon a plus r cos theta. And so this is a right angle triangle. And we can do a Pythagoras theorem and to work out a relationship between r and r prime. So by oh sorry by Pythagoras theorem Pythagorean theorem how about we must have that the hypotenuse squared is equal to the sum of the opposite 
and adjacent sides each squared. So opposite is R sine theta squared, and then we have adjacent side squared two epsilon A plus R cos theta, and then we square it all. All right, so we're just gonna expand the square here. So we would get R squared sine squared theta plus, uh, let me do R squared cos squared theta first, and then we'll have a four epsilon squared a squared. And then we have our cross term, which would end up being Uh, let's see, four, and then we have epsilon a r cos theta. Okay, so we can combine the cos squared and the sine squared, and that's just all r squared. And so what we end up with is r prime squared is equal to r squared plus uh, the two remaining terms have some common factors. There's a common factor of 4 epsilon a. And so if we factor that out, we get 4 epsilon a. And then we would have, from the first term, there's still an epsilon a left over. And from the second term, there's still an r cos theta left over. All right, so to go further, what I'd like to do is to see if we can rewrite r prime in place of r. What we're really ultimately trying to do is to come up with an expression for the radius r just in terms of the angle theta. Then we would know how the distance from F to any point on the ellipse varies with angle theta. So let's return to our condition that R plus R prime had to be equal to 2A. That's the first thing that we proved at the start of the video. Okay, so that means R prime is 2A minus R or r prime squared is 4a squared minus 4ar plus r squared. And so the next step is to take this expression for r prime squared and sub it into this expression above. Okay, so what we end up with then is, let's see, r squared plus, there's a common factor of 4a in the other terms. So we have 4a and then a minus r is equal to. Uh, so that expression above became r squared plus 4 epsilon a epsilon a plus r cos theta. In fact, I guess where I drew this arrow, I should have just drawn it to right here. Okay, <clears throat> so now what we've got is on both sides of the equation, I have an r squared, which I can cancel. And we also have a four a on both sides of this expression. And what are we left with? Um, we're left with a minus r is equal to epsilon squared a plus um, epsilon r cos theta. So the last step is to just solve for r. Okay, 
So we have r's on both sides of the equation. I'll take the minus r over to the other side and then factor out that common factor. So we would get an r1 plus epsilon cos theta is equal to. Um, and then we have an a, and I'm going to subtract off the epsilon squared a from the right hand side. And we would get a1 minus epsilon squared. So that finally, r is equal to a1 minus, uh, sorry, a1 minus epsilon squared divided by 1 plus epsilon cos theta. So this is the radius of the ellipse measured from f for any angle theta. So specifically, if I draw the ellipse here, here's f, here's r, and this is theta. The the quantity in the numerator of this expression, a1 minus epsilon squared, that's just a bunch of constants. That's a combination of constants. a is the semi-major axis, and epsilon is the eccentricity of this ellipse. Often, that combination of constants is rewritten in another way, and so I want to show you that. So when theta is equal to pi by 2. Okay, so what is what does our ellipse look like when theta is equal to pi by 2? So pi by 2 is 90 degrees. And so there's our horizontal. And this is pi by 2 for our angle theta. And that's the distance r. Okay. But from this expression above, we see that cosine theta is equal to 0 when theta is pi by 2. So at theta equals pi by 2, cos theta equals 0. Therefore, r is equal to just the numerator because we have the denominator is 1 plus 0 and so a is just 1 minus epsilon squared and this is usually defined to be alpha so this distance to the ellipse when theta is pi by 2 is denoted alpha and it has a funny name it's called the lattice rectum so alpha equals a1 minus epsilon squared is called the lattice rectum of the ellipse. In terms of alpha, the radius of the ellipse is equal to alpha 1 plus epsilon cos theta. What we'll end up doing is we'll end up returning to this expression when we try to prove Kepler's first law that planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to calculate the radius of the planet's orbit as a function of theta and show that what we calculate has the form of an ellipse and it's going to be an expression of this form. All right, so that's what I wanted to say about ellipses. Um, 
The next thing that I want to do is I want to start seeing if we can prove some of Kepler's laws. And in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to try to start by proving the second law. And the second law was that a line from the sun to the planet sweeps out an area in time delta t that's the same no matter where you are in the orbit. So next, what we're going to try to do is we attempt to prove uh, Kepler's second law of let's say equal areas in equal times. We're going to do this by showing that this law of equal areas that This law, oh sorry, this law is a consequence of conservation of angular momentum. Okay. <clears throat> So let's just assume that planets do follow an elliptical orbit around the sun. We'll put the sun over here. I'm going to exaggerate how the eccentricity of these orbits just for the purposes of the drawings. And what we'll do is we'll draw a radius vector from the sun to the planet. So the sun sits at the focus, one of the focuses of the ellipse and the velocity of the planet is tangent to tangent to the ellipse and so I could probably draw a little bit of a better tangent I think so here's the velocity and here's our planet of some mass m so by definition the angular momentum is r cross p and I'll write p as m times v where P is MV is the momentum of the planet. Okay, so let's start by just taking the derivative of the angular momentum with respect to time. So if we took the time derivative, that would be d by dt of r cross p. And by chain rule, or sorry, not chain rule, by product rule, we would get dr dt cross p plus r cross dp dt. But the time derivative of the position vector is just velocity. And the time derivative of momentum is the force on the planet. And so let's first consider that first cross product. Uh, we have V cross P, which is V cross MV, which is M times V cross V. But any vector crossed with itself is zero. Any vector crossed with itself is zero. And why is that? Let me just remind you of why that is. 
Let's consider the magnitude of V cross V. So the magnitude of a cross product is the magnitude of the first vector, which is just V, times the magnitude of the second vector, which is just V, and times the angle, the sine of the angle between them. But for parallel vectors, right, V is parallel with itself. For parallel vectors, theta is equal to zero, and therefore the sine of theta is equal to zero, and therefore we could say the magnitude of V cross V is equal to zero, but if the magnitude of the cross product is zero, then that means that just the cross product must be zero. Okay, so that first term vanishes. Um, and what we're left with then is, remember, we were taking the time derivative of the angular momentum, and so we're just left with r cross f. So r cross f is equal to dl dt. All right. <clears throat> Well, let's go back to our picture of the planet orbiting the sun. Oh. So let's say we put the sun over here, and then we have a position vector r out to our planet of mass m. And the force on our planet is the gravitational attraction to the sun. And so this is the force on our planet. And so now what we have is this cross product of r and f. And the two vectors aren't parallel, but they're anti-parallel. So if I was to write down the magnitude of r cross f, cross product has a magnitude of the magnitude of r times the magnitude of f times the sine of the angle between the two vectors. But for anti-parallel vectors, for anti-parallel vectors, uh, theta is pi radians are 180 degrees, and so therefore sine of pi is zero, and we can say that r cross f is equal to zero in this case for the gravitational force. Um, and so all of this is just really boiling down to the following. For a planet in orbit around the sun, we have that the time derivative of the angular momentum is zero, or angular momentum L is a constant or in other words some people would say that the angular momentum is a conserved quantity it's not changing with time so How is this going to help us with the Kepler's law of equal areas? Uh, what we have to do now is we now have to relate the angular momentum L to this area that's going to be swept out A. More specifically, what we're going to really do is we will relate L to how the area changes with time. So at what rate does a line from the sun to the planet sweep out area? And if we can show that there is a relationship between a dot and L, and we know L is constant, 
then that would tell us that anywhere in the orbit, the rate that area is swept out, a dot, would be a constant. And so that's really the goal. Okay, so let's try to do that. Here's another ellipse. Here's the sun. And I'll we'll define a, let's say, an xy coordinate system. Okay, and then here is our position vector r, and here's our planet somewhere in the orbit, and I'm going to define a unit vector r hat. So it just is specifying the direction of the position vector r, and then we have theta over here. Okay, so what we could say is that this vector r, the position vector, has some magnitude r and it's in the direction of r hat. And what we might want to do is we might want to write down the velocity of this planet. And so the velocity, oh sorry, what happened here? Okay, here we go. So we're going to try to write down the velocity. V is going to be d by dt of the position vector r, which is r times r hat. And so now we have, we've got to be a bit careful because we have this unit vector where if I was at some other position in the orbit, r hat, its length is not changing, right? A unit vector by definition is a length 1, but the angle of r hat is changing all the time, so its direction is changing. And if its direction is changing, then its time derivative is not going to be 0. So let's just make the important observation that Note that r hat direction changes with time. Or specifically, uh, dr hat by dt is not necessarily 0. And so our first task is to see if we can figure out what is the time derivative of r hat. And so let's take some length r and we'll say our r hat unit vector is collinear with r and then we're going to have some angle theta and so this is say the position of our planet at time t1. And I'm also going to define a unit vector theta hat, which if we're, say, we're measuring theta using a counterclockwise rotation, then theta hat is just tangent to the orbit. So if our planet was orbiting in the counterclockwise sense, theta hat would actually be in the direction of the velocity. Okay. So then we wait a short time and our planet has moved to some new position and so maybe it's over here and what we end up with is that the r hat vector, let's say r hat prime, is now in a slightly different direction and in fact so is theta hat prime. And let's suppose that the change in angle from t1 to time t2 is delta theta. So this red, the red vectors and unit vectors are indicated at some time t2. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to focus in 
on how these unit vectors have changed. So first we had, try to draw this a bit bigger, we had r hat and perpendicular to that we had theta hat. Then let's take the r hat prime and the theta hat prime and we'll draw them coming from the same origin as r hat and theta hat. So we've rotated a small amount. Here's r hat prime and here's theta hat prime. And the amount that we rotated is delta theta. So that, let's see if I can improve this drawing a little bit. So here's theta hat. That's a little bit better. Here's theta hat prime. And this is also angle delta theta. <clears throat> so we're interested in how r hat has changed from r hat to r hat prime. And so if we consider this length, we'd like to know what is the distance of that blue vector. And so if you remember arc lengths, so the blue line is a, let's say is in arc length, And the way that you determine the length of an arc is you take the radius and you multiply it by the change in angle. But in our case, r hat's a unit vector, so its length is just one. And so this blue arc is an arc length and it is equal to the radius 1 times the change in angle delta theta. And so, in fact, this length is just delta theta. Um, okay, and then we could say the same thing over here. Theta hat is a unit vector, and so its length is 1. And so there's an also a, a little length of arc over here that is equal to delta theta. Okay, so let's notice the following as well. If I was to take r hat and add to it delta theta in a perpendicular direction, uh, well, in fact, it doesn't need to be perpendicular, but the sum of r hat and this theta hat written as delta theta written as a vector is r prime. Okay, or we could do the opposite. We could say note that delta r hat is equal to the final r hat or r hat prime minus the initial r hat. But that's just this blue vector and that blue vector has a length delta theta and what direction is it in? Notice that this blue vector over here is approximately parallel to theta hat. And so that means that the difference r prime hat minus r hat is delta theta in the theta hat direction. Okay, let's do the same thing for theta hat. The change in theta hat is theta hat prime minus theta hat. And so that corresponds to a vector. Again, it's, that vector has a length delta theta. Which direction does this delta theta vector point in? It points anti-parallel to r hat. And so its direction is minus r hat.
So if all of this happened in a time interval delta t, we could say that delta r hat divided by delta t is going to be delta theta divided by delta t in the theta hat direction. Or d by dt of r hat is theta dot in the theta hat direction. Doing the same thing for theta hat, delta theta hat divided by delta t is equal to delta theta divided by delta t uh, minus r hat or d theta hat dt is equal to minus theta dot delta theta by delta t in the r hat direction. Okay. <clears throat> So that was a bit of work, but we now have expressions for the time derivatives of our unit vector r hat in particular. So if you go back way back to what we were trying to do, uh, we were trying to take this derivative of our position vector to get the velocity. And so I think we're now able to do that. We can say returning to uh, v is d by dt of r r hat. So that's our radius vector. That's going to be equal to r dot r hat plus r d r hat by dt. But we now know that that's second term is going to be an r and the r hat derivative is theta dot theta hat so we have v is equal to r dot r hat plus r theta dot theta hat Okay, good. Now, what we said is we were gonna try to relate the angular momentum to an area. So let's calculate angular momentum. It's R cross MV. And so R is gonna be R times R hat. And then we're gonna go cross M and v, we just calculated v, is r dot r hat plus r theta dot theta hat. OK, so the first thing we would end up with is an r hat cross r hat. And that's going to be 0. OK, another thing that we would have to evaluate here is r hat crossed with theta hat. OK, so let's imagine, oh, sorry, let's imagine we had r hat happen to be vertical, and theta hat, if we had a counterclockwise measure of angle, it would be perpendicular to r hat and in the direction to the left. So if you did the r hat cross theta hat, so remember what you would do is you'd put your arm in direction of r hat towards the top, you'd curl your fingers in the direction of theta hat to the left, and the thumb of your right hand will point out of the screen. And so we would say that r hat cross theta hat is out of the screen. And so let's, let's say out of the screen is the k hat direction. Oh no. Uh, 
don't know. I'll have to get better at doing this. Okay, so it's the k-hat direction. Okay, so this cross product that we're trying to calculate is therefore L is equal to, the first term vanishes, and then we get M and R and R, so we have an MR squared, and there's a theta dot, so there's theta dot, and that's going to be in the k-hat direction we determined. And we know that L is constant. Okay, so that's an expression for the angular momentum. Um, how are we going to relate that to an area? So let's suppose that here's the sun, here's R, and our planet is over here, and it's on some kind of elliptical path. So there's our path here. And we wait a very short time, and that short time later, the planet's over here. And so initially the angle was theta, but then after that short time delta t, the angle becomes theta plus delta theta. Okay, and we're interested in this area. So area A. So if, if we really look for a short time, say delta t is really small, then the radius of the orbit's not going to change much. And this area is approximately triangular. So if delta t is, I don't know why it does this. If delta t is small, then the area is approximately a triangle, and the height of this triangle is approximately R. Um, so we know how to calculate areas of triangles. It's one half base times height. And so the other thing we need to know is the length of the base of our triangle. But we've just already seen that these, these lengths are sections of arc. And so the length of this arc is the radius times the change in angle delta theta. And so that means for our triangle, A to a good approximation is one half the height times the base or actually let's call this let's call this delta A, the amount of area swept out. So that's equal to one half r squared delta theta. And if we divide everything by the time interval, we could say a dot, which is the area swept out in time delta t, is going to be one half r squared delta theta divided by delta t, which is one half r squared theta dot. But look over here, we have an r squared theta dot and we have an r squared theta dot. So what we could say is that 
r squared theta dot is equivalent to the angular momentum L, the magnitude of that vector, divided by m. So this is L divided by m. And so finally, what we end up with is, therefore, the rate that the area is swept out by the radius vector r is a dot is equal to l over 2m l and m are constants. Therefore, a dot is equal to a constant. And that's really the statement of Kepler's second law. Um, there is nothing special about the point in the orbit that we chose. We could have chose any point in the ellipse, and the analysis would be identical. And so this tells us that area swept out at a constant rate everywhere in the orbit. And so this is Kepler's second law. OK, good. So that's where we're going to finish. And uh, the next uh, video, we'll try to start uh, seeing if we can prove the other laws of the other Kepler laws for planetary motion. All right, thank you very much.